Good morning and welcome to Worship the First United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Scott Himmel. I'm joined in leading worship today with our liturgist, Andrea Thomas, our Director of Music Ministries, John Schumann, and many others. We're so glad that you and your family are worshiping with us on this beautiful morning. Our mission at First Group C is that we are a Christian community spreading God's love and welcoming all, offering spiritual growth and opportunities for compassionate service. Furthermore, we see all persons as created in the image of God and bearing sacred work and dignity. We invite all persons to participate fully in the life of our church, regardless of their age, race, ethnic background, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical or mental condition, marital status, family situation, economic standing, or citizenship status. If you're a visitor with us today, you will find uh, during the children's moment that we'll pass around the attendance pad to the blue section. You're invited, if you're so inclined, to fill out that blue section, and that will help us to connect you to the life of our community. And you can connect with us online throughout the week on our website, parkridgeumc.org, as well as our Facebook page. Turning to a few announcements following worship today in the parlor, we continue in uh, November following worship with uh, the signing of Christmas cards. And uh, see Mary Schumann, she has a Christmas card for you, or maybe a few of them you can write, put a nice note in, and then that will be hand-delivered by our youth on Christmas Eve to people as they exit worship. That's really touching, hope you can do that. Please note that the church office is closed during the work week this week for the Thanksgiving holiday. Both Amy and I are on vacation, and uh, Pastor Bob will be providing coverage throughout the week. He's preaching this coming uh, Sunday. So thank you to Pastor Bob for that. Hanging of the Greens is coming up this uh, next Sunday. And please consider staying after. There's all sorts of jobs for people to do to decorate the sanctuary and the church. And thank you to those who are coordinating that. We hope to be done by noon. On November 30th, in the evening at 6 p.m., a group of us will be driving out to Des Plaines First UMC and, uh, for a film series that's hosted by the Northern Illinois Conference's Anti-Racism Task Force. Uh, and they're going to be a Latinx dinner and then a discussion about the film The Bronze Screen. The film is free to see. There's a link you'll see in your bulletin or in the weekly e-news. You can just watch it on YouTube. And uh, all the other details are there in your bulletin. And a professor from Garrett will join us on Zoom to lecture and create a discussion around the film. It's going to be a special evening. Cookie Walk is approaching very quickly on Saturday, December 2nd. There are two ways you can order your cookies. There's a pre-order form you may find in your bulletin. You can fill that out. All the details are there on the form. And then on Saturday, December 2nd, from 9 to noon, you can physically come if you like and uh, pick up your cookies. So uh, everything there is in your bulletin for you. We are collecting Christmas gifts for at-risk youth in connection with our nonprofit partner kids above all. All the details are in your bulletin. Please note though, please don't wrap the gifts. Put them in a bag with the child's name. If you want to see the e-news, uh, there's a special email that's going out also in the e-news. There's a link that lets you uh, choose a child from a simultaneous list. So be sure to do that. And the suggested donation amount is $50. We need all the gifts by December 3rd. Our Goodreads book is coming, uh, discussion group is coming up December 5th, 7 p.m. by Zoom. All the details are there for you in the bulletin. And please be sure to see your bulletin, a colorful uh, sheet of all the Advent events that are coming up here very soon. Are there other announcements? With that, then let us center ourselves and enter worship with our words of gathering from Dr. King. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. Let us rise for our song of praise.
testify in your presence this morning. Please remain standing for the call to worship. In deep gratitude, we come to worship God. We recognize God as the source of all goodness. All good gifts come from the Spirit of God. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness are all of God. We come with grateful hearts, not for things, but for who God is. We gather to show our gratitude in song and prayer. Join me on the front steps today. And please sing with, with us.
our confession. Oh God, our world seems in such a mess. Great triumphs over generosity. Death appears stronger than life. People judge one another harshly. Sin abounds and grace receives far away. Forgive us, O oh God, when we succumb to the forces of sin, greed, judgment, and death. When we act as if you are not here with us. When we fail to do the things we should. Welcome all people with love and joy. Live in the attitude of abundance. Find ways to support your work in the world. Like the woman who can now pass the jar. May we lay all that we are and all that we have at your feet. Trusting in your forgiving and steadfast love. But we need a moment of silence. Friends, receive these words of assurance. Just as Jesus said to the woman with the alabaster jar, your sins are forgiven, so our Lord and Christ says those words to us today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Join me in the prayer of Everlasting God, whose tenacious love holds us, make our hearts the house of your truth, and make our minds the realm of your wisdom, so that our fellowship will become your dwelling place. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Greek test of reading this morning is Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him when he went to the Pharisee's house. He replied to him, and a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair, kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with my head. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of God for all the people of God. We continue this week with our sermon series called Living a Life of Gratitude. Let's pray together. Most loving and gracious God, bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that all may be and acceptable in thy presence. Now is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, now we're on. There we go. We're set. So I'd like to tell you all the story from Lynn Sweet's phenomenal book, From Tablet to Table. And it's a story about Frank Sinatra and something incredible that changed his life one Thanksgiving day. Well, Sinatra in the 30s and 40s was on a steep climb to start. All was going well in his life. But then when he hit the early 50s, 
He suffered through several different failures and forms of social embarrassment. You see, his career all of a sudden took a nosedive for various reasons. And then at the same time, his marriage fell apart on him. And if you remember that time in the 50s, for someone to become divorced had a lot of stigma attached to it. Now, after all of this happened, as Frank Sinatra describes it, he said, my fair weather friends deserted me. And what this meant functionally is just one example is every single day he noticed he was always eating lunch alone after all of this unfolded. But he had still one friend that was named Pascal Patsy Saul Manila. All right, what by Patsy? Now Patsy owned a restaurant in New York on 50, West 56th Street, still there to this day, an Italian restaurant. And whenever Sinatra would come to Patsy's, Patsy would sit with him for lunch. Well, one day it was a Thanksgiving week, and Sinatra realized he had nowhere to be the next day. So he called up his friend Patsy, and he asked if he could make a reservation for Thanksgiving. Well, Patsy didn't tell him that the restaurant was closed, all right? But Patsy went ahead and he accepted the reservation anyway, because he knew that Sinatra, he didn't have anywhere else to be, but he also wanted to forget that he had nowhere else to be, because it was very important. So Patsy did something incredible. He picked up the phone, he called all of his staff, and he explained the situation, asked them to come in the next day, just sit in the restaurant and be served, and make it look like the restaurant was open when Sinatra arrived. So Sinatra came to Patsy and sat down and he had an incredible meal that really helped him. Many years later, after Sinatra had reattained stardom, he discovered what Patsy did for him. And he was utterly blown away by it. Now, others didn't know this for many years. And reporters wondered why Sinatra would so regularly eat at Patsy's when he had the ability to eat at any restaurant in New York. But then columnist Bob Green eventually discovered the truth as he writes. It was no big secret to the Salt and Millow family. They all knew. A person recalls how he is treated not when he is on top of the world under him, but when he is at his lowest, thinking he will never again see the sun. What Patsy did changed Sinatra's life through radical hospitality, welcome, and love, and friends. Ultimately, here's the theological word, graciousness. To be graceful is freely given. That's one way that we can define it. I think that's what really blew Sinatra away. How far his dear friend went for him. And then we think about, well, how did that affect Sinatra? Well, think about where he was mentally before that moment, right? He was in a very low place, all right? But after this, he was filled with gratitude. When he, when he learned the whole story, that only grew. And then he began to focus on that, that moment of blessing and graciousness for the rest of his life because he continued to so regularly go back to Patsy's restaurant. You know, if we're not careful, we as human beings can become consumed in our thoughts with negativity, anxiety, worry, and even at an extreme end, self-loathing. And there's all sorts of triggers in our world today that can lead us very quickly, if we're not careful, into that kind of headspace, right? So the teaching of our scripture is this, that when we refocus our inward thoughts on Christ's loving and gracious forgiveness in relation to our scripture today, that, that adjustment of our interior focus has a direct effect on our outward actions. It becomes the source of our ability to be gracious and loving and generous and grateful and even forgiving. So let's turn to our scripture. Now, this week our scripture comes from the book of Luke, and Luke loves tables. More than any other account of the gospel, in Luke's telling of the gospel, one of the unique concords is he features Jesus at a table many, many times, and big things important to his ministry happen at the table. Part of why this is, is that tables were very important in ancient, the ancient Mediterranean world. You see, if you sat at a table with somebody in Jesus' time, it meant three things. It meant that you were, in effect, social equals, that you shared similar values together, 
and that you would also support one another in your future endeavors. Similarly, if you sat with an uh, unsavory person as deemed by society, that might reflect on you. And at an extreme end, it could even lead to social shunning, that people wouldn't want to be around that person, and then they wouldn't want to be around you as a result. But in an agrarian society, where everybody's depending on each other to survive, that's a really big deal, you see? So, Jesus, you know, he's the, he's the well-known rabbi. He's doing all sorts of incredible things, right? He has, his name is spreading throughout the land. And we learn in our scripture that Simon, the Pharisee, or Simon, the religious authority, he decides that he wants the prominent rabbi to come to his house for dinner. Now think of, you know, this time politics and religion are all told you. So think of Simon in his village, kind of like the mayor and the rabbi, all wrapped in one. He's a big shot, and it seems from little clues to text that he thinks he's a big shot too, all right? But he wants Jesus to be at his table that night. And then there's presumably there's other prominent people who are around the table, probably also some of Jesus' disciples. This is probably a big dinner. So it's kind of like a pseudo-public setting, to give you a picture. Well, Jesus, Jesus likes to be invited to parties, all right? But he does something really funny. Because Jesus really doesn't care what other people think. He cares a lot more what God thinks. Okay, we can learn something from that. But Jesus, he likes to come to parties like he's the guest, but then act like he's the host, okay? And so he does this. He's so great on inviting to the big party tonight. Well, I'm going to invite one of my own guests, all right? He decides he's going to invite a woman who we learn later in the scripture from Simon is thought of by the community as a sinner. Now, Fred Craddock helps us with this word. He explains this is a technical term in Luke's telling of the gospel. Sinner in this time refers to someone who has broken the Mosaic law. And it could be related to food purity, could be related to not observing the Sabbath, uh, could be worshiping an idol. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us. It's not so concerned with the specifics there. But the result of breaking the Mosaic Law and being labeled in this way by the community is that then you are shunned from the ability to participate in the local synagogue and or the temple in Jerusalem. Again, that has very real-world consequences in this kind of time period. Now, presumably, Jesus and the woman met before the dinner while he was walking around the town. He heard her story, and he forgave her. Now, the others at the table don't know that he's forgiven her yet. All right, and that's very unusual in ancient Judaism at the time for a rabbi to declare somebody forgiveness. All right, but he's told her that. And when he's in fact said to her, okay, this woman, love yourself again, because God loves you. And you can be a part of the community now, both the synagogue, both before God. And you can even come to the party tonight. You see what I mean? And you're my guest. Come on, right? Come on to the party. We're going to have a great time. I want to take a step back for a moment and think about the virtue of other gratitude. That is at the center of, of everything that we observe with the woman. And Aristotle helps us here. He explains that the virtue of gratitude is very unique and that it can only be practiced in response to another virtue that someone practices or offers, you know, in regard to us. So if someone is generous to us, someone is kind to us, someone offers us a, a kind of feeling, etc., then we can be grateful. We can practice that. You can't just be grateful to be grateful for nothing. You get it? All right? So the woman, you know, part of when we observe her actions here and her ecstatic response, you know, we, we're connecting it ultimately back to the significance of what Christ did for her. You see, it's all connected together. So we see in this woman one of the clearest responses of gratitude and generosity and love to that of Christ's gracious forgiveness in all of the gospel. She is such a memorable figure. And part of why she's so memorable is that the way that she responds to Christ's gift of forgiveness is not with words. She never says a word, right? It's with actions. And you know the saying? Actions speak louder than words. Those actions show her heart. They show how much this has made a difference in her life. So in that spirit, let's consider her actions for a moment. Now the text explains to us that the woman kneels behind Jesus' feet at the dinner while he's reclining. That's kind of funny, right? We think, is she crawling under the chair? Like, we can't really get our head around that. Well, here's, I want to show you a picture. This is from the social science commentary. It's a recreation of an ancient Mediterranean table uh, in a dinner setting. Now, you can't see it, but it's really a U-shape just off the right side that U opens. 
And you see there that the couches, okay, they're all around the center table. Now people, they would sit on these couches, not lotus style, like in the east, but they would, they would kind of lay down and they would lean on each other. Or you would kind of lay fully on each other, uh, depending how late you were into the meal, all right? And then they would pass around the food and they'd eat with their hands. It was all very hygienic, don't worry, all right? Now, now then, the slaves or servants, they would come from that open side and they would take plates away, they would bring plates, okay? And they would also attend to the guests' needs or they could kind of come behind them, all right? So that's what Luke is referring to. It's probably the case that Jesus is kind of on the end and his feet are hanging out over the edge of the couch. The woman is kneeling down next to his feet and caring for him there. So. What we observe in her actions are reflective of basic Mediterranean hospitality customs. That really helps us to understand what's going on here. So usually when you come to a dinner, the, the servant of the host would come and bring you a basin of water and a towel and would wash your feet and dry them. Now this is necessary. You wear sandals all day, right? Your feet are very smelly and dirty, right? This is kind of needed, okay? So what does the woman do? Well, she goes beyond that, right? She uses her own tears for water, and she dries Jesus' feet with her hair. Wow, okay, that would shock everyone. And then it says, you know, in the ancient world, the, uh, an inexpensive perfume would be used by one of the servants to anoint you, or they would kind of dab with your head, your chest, maybe your feet, to remove some, some body odors, because the odor, this was needed, right? It's like a dog pack at that table. You're gonna smell everybody, right? So you need a little bit of perfume so you can get through the meal. Now what does a woman do? She brings, not cheap perfume, she brings alabaster oil. That's expensive oil. In another telling of this story, it explains that it's 300 days worth of wages. She has gone far beyond what is expected in terms of anointing Jesus. And she doesn't anoint his head, she anoints his feet with this very expensive oil. And this is a very quick aside. Nothing untoward is happening to you. Okay, in ancient uh, Judaism, when a woman kneels down and lets down her hair, that's a sign of mourning or repentance. Everyone at the table would know. This woman is either mourning or, given they, they refer to her as a sinner, they're probably already connecting this in their brain. She's repenting, okay, of what she has done before the whole community by being here at the dinner and taking on this kind of body posture and actions. So, let's come back to Simon. Now, Simon, right, he's the host, okay, at the table. And by all outward appearances, he acts like everything's going great. All right? He says nothing. He's all smiles, all nice words, eloquent words, okay? But in his mind, there's a whole flurry of thoughts going on there that he doesn't want to admit to anybody. Now, that Luke steps in his narrator and discloses his thoughts to us. Simon says to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Biblical commentator McCall Dayler explains that in ancient Mediterranean writings, it's very, very unusual for the inner thoughts of a person in a story to be disclosed to that of the readership or the audience. When it does happen, it's a big deal, usually a moment of crisis or a pivotal moment in the story. And then specific to ancient Jewish literature, and this goes back to a proverb, it's thought that when we, we observe a character's inner thoughts, it reveals whether that character is wise or foolish based on the words that one says to oneself in the secrets of one's heart. That's, that's the problem, the paraphrase the sense. So in that spirit, we consider, is Simon wise or foolish based on these thoughts that he's thinking to himself? Well, we're left to conclude based on two observations that he's foolish. The first is that he assumes that Jesus is not a prophet of God, when we know as the readers or the audience that he is not just a prophet, but he's a Messiah, so he misjudged Jesus. But he also misjudges this woman, or he might more accurately say he profiles or he stereotypes her. He puts her in a little box and thinks that all she'll amount to in life is to be a sinner by calling her this kind of woman and then referring to her via a name as that of a sinner. You know, we learn from Simon that any time that we are too quick to judge people, and especially when we put people in little boxes and we remove the ability for them to grow beyond their current state, we've really, we've really gone beyond the frame of the gospel. And we need to go back to Christ's teachings and the piercing truths of God's word and relate our thinking back to God's word to reorient ourselves. You know, we can think of stereotyping or profiling often in our world today in reference to skin color, 
Uh, it could be gender, sexual orientation. What's interesting here is we see how we can also stereotype people based on how they treated us in the past. All right? And we can begin to look down on them because of that. And again, put them in that little box. And part of the teaching of the story is don't do that. Okay? Don't put people. People can be so much more than they are today, especially when the grace of God starts to work in their life. Let's just think about Simon again for a minute. Think of, think of the text and visuals. Right? He's the host of this table. He is both literally and figuratively looking down on this woman. Okay? And so I mean, it really changes how we see this passage. Part of the other teaching of Luke is like, evaluate your inner thinking. You know, compare that to God's Word and be sensitive to what truths you speak to yourself or lies in your heart. So Jesus, he perceives what Simon is thinking. And this is the fulfillment of a prophecy in Luke 2, verse 35, that we're meant to connect directly to our text. This is spoken by Simeon over the Christ child in the temple. This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. So think about our past. Simon is putting himself above the woman, right? Who cried and judgment. The woman is putting herself below the rest of the community. She's beside herself. Jesus, through perceiving everybody's thoughts, he brings them together so they can sit at table again with one another. Part of the significance of why this is happening at the table. So Jesus, after learning or perceiving Simon's thoughts, he then speaks a parable to him. Now, Jesus could just disclose his thoughts, but that would be so boring for Jesus to do it that way. He has to use a parable to make everybody think, right? So here's a parable. It's super simple. It's meant to be simple. Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And then Simon feigns respect. Rabbi, speak. Okay? Well, we really know what he's thinking about Jesus. So Jesus says, there's a generous creditor. Okay? And there's two debtors. One has a debt, one a small debt. The creditor decides to forgive both of them. Who is more grateful? All right. So Simon thinks. And then he says, I suppose the one for whom the greater debt has been forgiven. Okay. And Jesus, that's the man who studied the law his whole life. All right. And Jesus says, probably with a good bit of sarcasm, you have judged rightly. Right? It's so obvious. So what we notice is why did Simon hesitate and say, I suppose? It's because we argue he knows where Jesus is going with this. Part of Jesus, the point of the parable is be the generous creditor, forgive people, including those with, who've done a lot of bad things. All right? And he doesn't want to forgive this woman. Okay? He might even pick up that he's being compared. We don't know, but maybe he's even figuring out what Jesus is about to compare him. And that's where we go next. So Jesus then says to Simon, Do you see this woman? And that's a really powerful question. Have you ever gone to a party and there's somebody you don't want to be there with? All right? And you're kind of like, okay, I'm going to stand over here, you go over there, and if we happen to pass by, we're going to give mean eyes to each other, and we're going to look this way, and we'll all just, don't look at me. You know what I mean? Like, it's awkward. Jesus picks up. He knows there's this awkwardness underneath all the smiles and the laughter. So he just calls it out. He says, Simon, do you see this woman? I need you to look at her right here. All right? And then he creates a comparison that you know Simon, in all his prominence, did not appreciate. He compares them together. He says, listen, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, no towel. All right? What did she do? She bathed my feet with her tears and then dried them with her hair. He said, listen, you gave, you gave me no kiss, not even on the cheek. She's kissed my feet. He says, and listen, furthermore, Simon, you know what? You didn't even anoint my head with oil, a basic expectation. She took expensive oil and she anointed my feet. All right? So Jesus says this. What he's explaining is that Simon has fallen below the basic standards of Mediterranean hospitality. Whereas this woman, who's labeled a sinner, she has by far exceeded the winner, the woman, right? Now, we're left wondering, how in the world could this happen? Okay? That's what everybody's thinking at this table. This man, Simon, a religious authority who studied the law his whole life, how could he fail at basic Mediterranean customs of hospitality at his own dinner? When this woman, who everyone looks down on, has exceeded them. Well, Christ breaks the tension. Here's our four verses, the whole passage. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. He's now freed everybody at the table. What Jesus is explaining is that the woman has, has attained a, a transformation of her inward thoughts. 
by being in relationship with Jesus. You see, when Jesus speaks words to people in the gospel, as presumably he did before all of this, you know, before the dinner, people are affected by it because the Spirit is moving through him into their lives. And she had this powerful interior transformation that she is forgiven before God and the whole community. And when we have that kind of inward transformation, it leads to an outward explosion of good works that come from us. And gratitude is a part of that, but also generosity, okay, care, healing, forgiveness. And we see that in the woman. Jesus is saying, listen, Simon, she connected spiritually with, my, with the forgiveness of God, and that has changed her life. And Simon, by comparison, he is not. He needs to go a little further down the spiritual road. One of the most important moments on our spiritual journeys throughout this life friends, is realizing deep down in the innermost depths of our being that we are completely and utterly loved by God just for who we are. With all of our warts, our failures, even our sins, that God continually accepts us back again and again and again. It says, you are my precious, beloved, forgiven, redeemed child whom I will go to any lengths to continue to be in relationship with, in particular, through the laying down of my life on the cross for you, so that you have absolute assurance that you are always loved. In this way, friends, Christ's gift of forgiveness to us is in many ways about giving ourselves another chance in life, realizing we can be so much more than our moments of failure, but it's also about loving ourselves again. It's like you love yourself, and you, you connect that love back to Christ's love for you, and you find that origin point of that love. And then it changes you from within. And then, we friends are called graciously to offer that gift of forgiveness to other people. See, we have empathy for others who have wronged us. And we also uh, seek to reconcile with people who we have wronged. And that way, we offer the gift of forgiveness to those who have wronged us because we, we connect with them that we both are struggling with our failures. We want to love them again. And then we go to others who receive that gift because we want to be in relationship with them. Sometimes life is not always possible, okay, in relationship. There's complexity in these things. But as Christians, we're called to try. And if it really is impossible to reconcile, then at least we in our hearts are called, as Jesse Tutu reminds us, to let go of the hate and to embrace love in relationship to God and all peoples. When we do that as a whole community, friends, that's when the forgiving love of Christ reunites tables again with the perfect people who are made whole through Christ's forgiving love. And that is truly something to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. So let's come back to Patsy for just a moment. Why did Patsy do that? Why did Patsy go to such lengths to care for his friend with such radical hospitality? Maybe, friends, it was because at some point in Patsy's life, he was unloved. He was unforgiven by somebody. He wasn't welcome. Right? Maybe it was that he reflected the Christ's forgiving love when you see the image of the Or maybe, with those two points in mind, he had a vision of Thanksgiving. That at Thanksgiving, our tables should be abundant with love and grace and peace, not scarce. That they should be united, not divided. That they should be forgiven and not hated. This Thanksgiving, let's all try to be a little bit more like Patsy, like the woman, and ultimately, like Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
your spoken prayers. Let's pray together. Most loving and gracious God, we begin this day by lifting up to you Ashton Ball, our Director of Children, Youth, and Family Ministries, and her family. As Ashton uh, is Oklahoma with her family this day, uh, to be in particular with her grandmother who is on hospice care and close to passing. Be with her and her family during this difficult time. May they sense our love and care as her faith community. For returning for our world, we lift up to you the people of, Is of Israel and those fighting also with the rocks. God, the news reports are totally clear, but it seems like a ceasefire may be possible. We pray for peace. And God, on this Thanksgiving holiday coming up, we give thanks to you for all of the gifts and blessings that you shower upon us. We pray for safe travels for everyone who are going to visit family and returning home. We pray that everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. In your name we pray. Amen. And friends, I'd like to share one quick joy with you today. My sister Ellen and my brother-in-law John are here from Texas visiting us today. Ellen and John, if you don't mind standing, let us welcome you today. He's at Naperville attending church with my father and mother. My father's preaching today. And I thought, oh, it's because you want to go see your grandfather preach. He said, no, it's because I want to sleep in and I can go later. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's got his priorities straight, right? He's 18. All right. Well, what prayers are on your hearts today? I'll bring the mic to you. So continued prayers for Colin's uncle Wayne, who had a double lung transplant. He went back into the hospital because he had a bacterial infection, and he's home now, but has to be on an IV for at least two weeks. So continued prayers for him. Let's take a moment to pray. Loving and gracious God, we are so sorry for all that Wade is going through. We unite our hearts with you and with Nikki and Colin and family. Uh, as they go through this time, we pray for healing for way, and then he senses our love and care in your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. My vision. Sorry. Here we go. Here you go. Um, I'm asking for prayers for my cousin, John Adams, who uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer this past week. And to his brother Tom and John's wife Cindy and uh, all their families. Oh, let us pray for you. Loving and gracious God, our hearts are heavy to learn of this news and John's diagnosis. Be with him and family during this time. We pray that they sense your love and your care. And God, we give thanks for Katie and Ed and their love and support of your cousin. In your name we pray. Amen. Yes. I ask for prayers for our high school friend, Linda. Uh, she's had two surgeries and expects to have three or four more for her cancer. Oh, let's pray for Linda. Loving, gracious God, be with Linda this day. We are so sorry for all that she is going, to, going through in connection with her cancer. We pray that these surgeries are successful and there is an alleviation of her suffering. We thank you for Alice and her dear relationship over many years. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. I've read a lot of Carol and I have to move again. Let's pray for Carl. Gracious and loving God, be with Carl. He's gone through some very difficult years as of late. God, we pray that the doctors are successful, that you be with him and help him, God, to. Uh, heal from this. We thank you for Pat and her love and care for her dear brother-in-law. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Amen. Yes. I feel that this church is a place where we can feel the newness and wonder of God here in the church. Bless us with you. Or a way of seeing this world in this country, our sense of the beauty and the freedom and goodness to be here with each other, love, laughter, language, and learning. Thank you. 
What a word of grace. Thank you so much. Praise be God. For any way that the Spirit moves you to play in this space. Thank you for you. Thanks for my uh, sister in law, Danielle, who's recovering from surgery this week. Let's pray for Danielle. Loving and gracious God, we pray for Danielle this day. Be with her. We pray for a successful recovery. We thank you for Bob and Lisa and their support of her. In your name we pray. Amen. Other prayers? Yes, thank you. I got some good news. All right. Well, but, uh, Roseanne, can you call for me again? My brother, Jim Bowser, is okay. Good. So, on the result, I hear the hospital boys must be for the extended for the physical surgery to be placed back to the world. Both the doctors and the physical surgery. And everybody else. Uh, so, thank you very much for all your prayers. Thank you. Let's celebrate that in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that Michael is doing well on the other side of his leg operation. Be with him in his recovery and bless Danny with dear brother this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Prayers for Andrew Lee
Uh, hopefully we don't have any surprises in November and December, which can sort of make that more interesting, but we've done a great job there as well. And the best news about this is that when we went into the year, we were planning on uh, only paying half of our apportionment for the Northern Illinois Conference uh, apportionment. And with this, we're projecting that we would be able to pay the full apportionment for the Northern Illinois Conference. So, Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the stewardship campaign. Typically, we'd be in the middle of a stewardship campaign right now. Uh, a number of you have come up to me and said, Rocky, we're, we went to stewardship campaign. We're missing the finance chair leading us to get more money. <laughs> so, fear not, fear not. Uh, the stewardship campaign is going to be during Lent this year. We worked with uh, the Ad Council and trustees and Pastor Scott. Is, brought this idea to us from other churches that he's worked at. Uh, we're in the process of going through the budgeting for next year right now. Uh, we'll talk about it at the Ad Council meeting on, uh, on November 27th, finalize that by the end of the year, and then in late February, March, and April, we'll have our stewardship campaign. Uh, that, so please continue to give um, you know, as you've been giving until that time. Um, and then we'll, during the stewardship campaign, we'll sort of go through what the needs are of the church for 2024, and we can make any adjustments as are needed then. But if anyone wants to contribute more, you are welcome, encouraged, blessed, celebrated to do so. But anyway, thank you for everybody's efforts. So much, Rocky, for your leadership and your presentation today. Thank you to all of our leaders. It's really is a team effort of careful budgeting to achieve those numbers. And thank you to all of you, friends, for how you allow the generous spirit of God to move through you, the offering of your time and your talents and your gifts to make possible the life transforming ministries of our congregation. We now turn to the time of offering. There are two ways to give the offering plate, as well as our website, parkridgeumc.org. Let us practice the virtue of generosity together. <laughs> And it is my pleasure and privilege to make this today with Amy and Roger, and it's good to have Eddie back and the rest of the choir singing. <laughs>
signing in the parlor following work. I hope you can take a moment to do that. See Miriam Schumann, she'll give you a card. Uh, a reminder that the FCRC has a meeting starting at 11 o'clock in the library. And finally, friends, I hope that everybody here has a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Hope you get some rest, eat lots of turkey, have a great time, and now take a good nap, right? I'll thank on the afternoon. Now receive our benediction. May the Holy Spirit fill all of us with gratitude, an overwhelming gratitude for Christ's love. And Christ is God among us, who reveals to us God's loving and forgiveness. And that that would fill us completely and lead to ecstatic good works in all areas of our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we say together, Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. As we go forth, let us pass the peace of Christ with one another.